remember years ago seeing this video of this young girl experiencing rain and probably before she ever entered school. And it was really amazing to watch her as she was outside in the rain, the, the look of wonder and curiosity in her eyes. And what was interesting about the video is that her mom pulled her out of the rain and the young lady started actually kicking and screaming. And she actually ends up fighting her way back out to that rain, which I thought was really compelling and interesting. And I always ask the question, like, do our kids kick, scream, and fight to get in schools every day because we foster that wonder, that curiosity. And that's something that we should really try to focus on, that when our kids leave our schools, they're as curious, if not more so, than when they first graduated. And that's why I'm really excited that today I had David Jakes on the podcast. And what we talked about is his new book, The Design Thinking Classroom, using design thinking to reimagine the role and practice of educators and as i was talking to david he talked a lot about fostering that wonder fostering that curiosity not only in ourselves but our students and i think he talks about it in a way that makes it really attainable in our classrooms even within some of the structures that we still have to deal with to really give kids experiences to solve problems that are meaningful to them and that should be a huge goal of our schools is developing that curiosity within our students. So I know you're going to love this podcast. Um, if you could write some of your comments, your thoughts in the comments down below, I encourage you to, to subscribe and like uh, the podcast uh, down on YouTube. If you're watching this, I really try to focus on, you know, trying to grow the channel because I'm so blessed to talk to incredible educators like David today and um, to be able to share his book. So Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoy another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm so excited to have David Jakes on the podcast. He actually has a brand new book out called The Design Thinking Classroom. And actually, every time you put up the, every time you put it up, I'm like, why do you have a sticky note on it? And it's on. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I, when, it's funny when I show this in my when I open the box and my sister goes, all the sticky notes on the <laughs> said so the same yeah, thing. It looks yeah. like there's an actual sticky note on there, kind yeah, of threw me off, right? So design thinking classroom using design thinking to reimagine the role and practice of educators. And I'm really excited about this. And David, I've been following you. I said this on our last podcast. You're probably you are one of the first people I remember following on Twitter. Now, I know I followed several people, but you're one that really was memorable to me. You were very helpful to me right when I started doing stuff. And you always really challenged my thinking to always try to do better for kids. And I think that's something that's really kind of in this book and your ideas and your sharing. So I'm excited to sit and talk to you. And I, the one reason I love this podcast is it forces people to like that I really like to sit down and talk with me. <laughs> it's so like, I haven't seen you in years. So I was like excited yeah. to talk to you. And we talked about Chicago Bears stuff and basketball before too. And so I always appreciate that. So for the people who are listening to this who don't know, you can tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and what you do today. Thanks for having me again, George. And uh, I'm, again, I'm really excited about the book and its potential impact. I'm glad to be here and talk, with, talk to you about this. My background is I spent 27 years in public K-12 education, 15 is a biology teacher, and then 12 is an administrator, both at the school district and building level in instructional technology. So I, I you know, after 27 years, I, I, got a really, I got interested in design and I had a, a really unique offer to leave education and join the Third Teacher Plus studio of Canon Design in Chicago. Canon Design is an international design firm. They have offices across the country in the U.S. and in the world. And so they design higher education facilities and K-12 facilities, as well as healthcare, principally hospitals. I so said, do I want to leave education? Is this on the right stop? And I go, it was too compelling not to do that. So I jumped ship, left education, joined the firm. It was a completely different experience working in corporate America. And I worked on 60,000 square feet of a design studio in downtown Chicago with 250 world-class designers. And it is interesting. I thought I knew something about design. Turned out I didn't know much about design at all. And literally the two years that I spent at the Third Teacher Plus was like a second master's degree. And people taught me, I had an opportunity to learn design by being immersed in it, which is obviously the, probably the best way to learn it. And I learned so much. And 
after two years, to be honest with you, I got, was looking for something different, tired of commuting down to Chicago and getting home at eight o'clock every night. And so I said, I think I can, I think I can launch my own practice. I've been, I had been doing consulting for a number of years previously, part of what I did as an educator in. And so I hung out my shingle and here I am eight years later, my own practice and the book now. And I do a lot of design work. I have my own design projects. I have a, a, a new project down in Nicaragua, for example, I'm taking an existing two-story structure and turning it into a science and innovation center. Um, and do a lot of partner work with architecture firms to provide an educator lens to the design of schools. And that can be, could be a new high school, for example, it could be a master plan work that might encompass understanding how spaces work across the entire school district. A lot of different ways in which I lend an educator voice to the architectural process. And then I still do some professional development, but not as much as I used to, because I've been really busy with my design work and writing the book. That That's a quick synopsis of a 36 year, year career. The thing that I'm most interested in, I tell people about when they ask me about my career is that I've got, I've been fortunate to have many different pathways and I have experience as a classroom teacher, as an administrator and leader in a leadership role in school, as a technologist, and now as a designer. So I have a lot of different lenses that I bring to a project. And I'm especially proud that the book represents all those different lenses and this compilation piece of all those different identities that I've had in education and in bringing forth a, com a compelling and composite story about those different areas into, a sing into the book. So I got, actually got a two-part question based on what you just said. Right. And the first one is, the first part of this is, yeah, you were pulled into corporate America with your experience as an educator. And a lot of times what we do in education, we look at like Google, we look at outside businesses, and we take some of those ideas and implement them in our classroom some ways. We pick those things up. But I think a lot of times there's missed opportunities from like, organizations and businesses outside of education to learn from teachers. And so what did they see? Cause I, I know and maybe it's not the best thing to be talking about right now. I know a lot of people outside of education are looking out or in education are looking outside and looking for opportunities there. So why do you think they saw your experience as a teacher to actually pull you outside of education to to learn from you what do they see as the benefit of that it's interesting let me start in a couple of different ways i used to be in meetings <clears throat> with the, with all the architects and they would talk about elevations and things like that and i had no clue what an elevation was and simply a side view of a building and i'd say i'd raise my hand and the first thing they would say is you don't have to raise your hand <laughs> <laughs> It's not school. And so what's an elevation? And they'd be, they'd laugh a little bit and then they'd, they'd explain it to me and so on. And we'd go out then to a client's, to a school district and the school district would be talking about project-based learning, for example. And we'd come back to the studio and we'd be in our, in our meeting room and they'd look at me and they'd go, what's project-based learning? And they go, ah, the shoes on the other foot now, huh? And so I'd explain it to them. So, so. You should have made them put up their hand. Yeah, so you're, you're, please raise your hand. I'll, I'll, I'll be glad right. to call on you. Yes, <laughs> wish I would have thought of that. That's a good idea. So good architecture firms know how to ask questions and they can do a great job designing schools and spaces. They're really great architects. Look for ways to understand education with a really deep nuance. They don't have the background in education. They don't understand all those things. And it's not anything that's negative towards architects or architects and not mm -hmm. educators. So my particular, my role was to translate that. I can have a different conversation with the superintendent, with the principal, with the teacher than an architect can ever have. And that's just reality because I've stood in front of kids before, right? So they saw value in, they saw value in that. And they saw value in, in giving, literally, to be honest with you, as a competitive advantage. So we'd go into interviews and you have to win jobs in education. So you have to, you have to respond to an RFP, a request for a proposal or a request for RFQ, a request for qualifications. And you have to get shortlisted, which means they take 10 firms down to three firms and they have to go into interview. And so the clients, surprisingly, were always really shocked to see an educator on the team. Hmm. And they weren't expecting that. And so it gave our group a different kind of a competitive advantage. Now, what happened, what's happened and since is that most firms now have taken on educators in, in a particular similar role, similar role, but I think I was one of the first to do that. You know, what I, they, I was originally hired as a digital designer and strategist. What they wanted to do was actually help have me help build digital layers or virtual layers over the physical designs of the buildings they were creating. 
the clients weren't ready for that. So literally within six months, I had to reinvent myself again. And so I became the community engagement specialist, being able to walk into school districts, sit down with teachers and have those conversations and then translate that. Here's a really interesting story. The, and this is the magic of architecture in my experience. I would go out and do my thing and come back and sit down with an architect. We'd go into a room, a huddle room or, or go somewhere on the studio floor. And they would take out a roll of what's called trace. It's just trace paper. They just called trace. And they take up sharpie and I would say, they go, tell us what you heard. And I would start talking about what they were interested in, the kind of experience they wanted to have, the kind of building and spaces they want to have. And they would start sketching on the trace paper. And I would sit there and I'd watch this design start to emerge. And it was the most magical of experiences because it was coming, literally coming out of my mouth into their head, traveling down their arm onto that sharpie, onto that paper. And I was go. How do you how do you people do this? And they go, David. That's what we do. And I will never forget those experiences because a great high school design starts with a conversation, a piece of tracing paper, and a sharpie. And it's just the people I worked with in my were probably the most creative. And I worked a ton of great educators. Trust me. But the people that I worked with at the Third Teacher Plus Design Studio were some of the most creative individuals I've ever worked with. And that it goes true of a lot of architects. Are really creative people. They get taught that and actually in, in, in their process. And so that's, that's, I forget what the original question is, but that was, that's my response. They, and that actually really lends into the second part of the question, because they obviously, if anything has been exposed in the last two to three years is that everybody, it doesn't matter where you work, it is crucial that you have the ability to learn and adapt. And there's no better people to actually teach that than educators who that is yeah. what they do to actually teach people how to learn. It's not just content, but it's actually the ability to learn in the first place. And one of the things that I appreciate when we were talking about the book, really you provide practical strategies for people. And we're going to talk, I'm going to ask you in a bit, what design thinking, how you actually define that, what that means to you. But when you look at the outside of experience, what you did is you provided some really practical ideas. And I know that it's from, uh, kind of holistic perspective of your time as an educator and the time that your work doing now. So what are some of the things that maybe you, if you were in the classroom and maybe an example that you share in your book would do for, because of the stuff that you learn outside of education, because I think some kids, this is experience is sometimes kids, we're so basically in school that kids are really good at school when they walk out, but they're not necessarily having real world. I don't even say, I don't even have to say the term real world, just real, like real learning that happening. So like when you worked outside of education, what are some of the experiences that you had that maybe would have reshaped some of the things that you would have done in school if you were to go back? That's a great question. And play off a little bit about your real world. We always hear that in the context of school and, I, and people always want to have experiences that are more real world. And my response to that is that there's no more real world than school. So I think my experience beyond education has taught me that I think I'm always impacted and the, and the book makes a case for this is that the world of school is somewhat isolated and siloed in the sense that school needs to be, and what I've learned is that school needs to be much more experiential and expose kids to a greater range of experiences where they have to have to develop certain different qualities. I talk in the book about lifelong, life wide and life deep learning and lifelong learning is a trajectory. It's over the lifetime. It's a linear distance. When we talk about life wide learning, we're talking about along that timeline, a greater range of experiences that teach kids and expose them to different conditions. A lot of, the, and when you do that, you have a chance to develop what's called life deep learning experience opportunities. And that's where kids learn the things that relate to being human, the qualities of, for, of being human, for example, empathy, persistence, resilience, being collaborative, and all those things that we want kids to be. There's an opportunity to, the biggest thing for me is my, and certainly in my work as an entrepreneur, people always ask me, are you going to hire somebody? I said, no, I don't need to do that. Because what I do is I assemble a team on demand. That's the way that works. You don't literally have employees, but you have people in your network that you rely on. You bring them onto projects. The world of the classroom, and I still see it, George, and, I, and, it's, and it, it's, it still shapes my thinking in a lot of ways. I still, when I walk into schools, I still see the rows of steel frame desks with the teacher at the front with, nobody learns like that anymore, except in schools. 
You know, there's the greater range of experiences that provide kids with opportunities to grow in different directions and develop the qualities that that are meaningful for them as people and as citizens and as people that will support democracy and things like that. These are all essential things to schools. And we go, you take kids on the field trips and that word really bothers me in a lot of ways in the sense that you go get in a bus, you scurry back, you go out to some a museum or someplace and you scurry back to the safety. The drawbridge goes up and you go into the, the school again. The world works in, in this way and it's all connective. It's all integrated together. There's massive opportunity for kids to explore different directions. I think sometimes we get in schools, we get limited by the potential outcomes of what kids can look at. And we look at going to college and we're going to four year, two year, going to military, going to work. I'd love to see schools focus on things like entrepreneurship and mm. developing additional ways in which kids can grow and develop. I think going back to your question, it's what I've learned outside is that there's this need for this greater connective, more deep and engaging human kind of experience that school can provide. And so like that actually, I was going to ask you about, we were talking about AI a little bit earlier and like the chat GPT thing, that, what's going yeah. on with that. And I think part of it too, is we were just having this conversation with a group of educators this last week. I'm like, basically if chat GPT could write your essay the, and do all the requirements, then maybe we need to rethink like what we're asking of our kids. And so exactly. I've actually been utilizing it to do some book reviews in the sense that I'll say, Hey, I asked chat GPT and I reference it to just do a summary of this book and I'll read it, but I'll say if I was reading a website, but then I actually make some really human connection to what I learned that only can come from me. It can't, you, chat GPT couldn't say that part, but it's to me, it's like a supplemental thing, but not a replacement. And if it's a replacement, we have issues. And so I think, so how do you see that human connection and the importance of it connected to how we utilize chat GPT, AI in classrooms today. It's, it's like any disruptive technology. It's the same kind of thing. It's, we had conversations around this with Wikipedia. You can't use Wikipedia because it's not written by experts. Even though you can look at the, the, the history of any particular article and a lot of the good ones, and it's referenced and it's cited and it's a lot of deep research behind it. When you get phones, you gotta, we gotta do that. We gotta take, we can't use our phones in class. And there's reasons for doing that certainly. Mm -hmm. And so it's the first initial response is to, oh, well, let's block this. And it's because it's disruptive and it, what it does is it pushes schools and teachers out of their comfort zone in the ways of, of we've always done this in the status quo. Chat G, I can't remember the yeah, few letters. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I'm actually doing it's, what the answer right now. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's that thing online that I've written it. I've used it to write tweets, believe it or not. Uh, yeah. And in actual introductions and project proposals. I used it last week in a community event at night with a hundred community members mm -hmm. where I asked it to write a story about classrooms in Dr. Seuss language and it created a perfect poem in 35 seconds. With Dr. Seuss style about classrooms. And so what's happening is this, it's, we get this tug of war going on where we have these fundamental things about about education, it's literacy, right? It's about being able to read, write, communicate, all those fundamentals with things that we think are essential to an educational experience and prepare kids is, as people. But then we get this disruptive technology that pulls us in different directions. And it's this constant tug of war where this will land and where, how it will shape. It's gonna, it's going to, yeah, and you're exactly right. If I can write it, if I can ask it to write a summary of Mark Twain, and I get a great essay in, in 45 seconds, then what we need to do is rethink what that means. Where I see, to answer your question, I see this, to, for example, could this, one of the things we've always sought in education is to have a more personalized kind of experience with kids. And going back to personalized means more human. And so are there opportunities to craft individual pathways for kids that make their experience more human, more applicable to their lives and more interesting to them? And when you're looking at a school of 3,000 kids, for example, high school, there's not the manpower to do that. So I wonder how technologies like, like artificial intelligence actually can be a complement to what we do and how that can take us into things that inherently are much more human, but we don't have the capacity to, in schools to, to make that a realization. So that's where I'm leaning. I think, I think it's an, it's an interesting technology. It's learning day by day. Who knows where it's going to be in a year from now. Robotics is the same thing. Some of the things that robots can do pretty crazy. But that says is that if we look at that in a holistic level, we say we can't continue to prepare our kids in the same way. We just can't. The things we did 10 years ago, 
20 years ago, we have to rethink. And I don't know how much of that's occurring in schools, to be honest with you. It's the, the, the world, we're coming out of the, uh, the most disruptive time that I think any of us have experienced as human beings, certainly, I think. And when I look at schools, just in a real, in another minute, answer your question, we have these, we have things in school. Schools are big places. I worked the last place I worked in was 3,000 kids. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that is, can go on. And there's a lot of things we've done in education to make sense of our day. We've built schools into containers. We've got bell schedules. We've got freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. We've got teachers, administrative staff members. We've got all these containers. We have ability levels. We have all kinds of things. Those are all put up to design to make sense of the school day and provide an orderly structured kind of experience. Those are the very things that when you try and change school or do go in a different direction, those things that we put in place to help us with the day are the very things that get in the way of change. Change, try to change a bell schedule, you know what I mean? That's what's happening with this. It's we've got all these expectations and this understanding of what education is right. and how it has been. Now we've got the, these disruptive tools that are fundamentally shifting our expectation of what the school, daily school experience should be and needs to be. And what's interesting about your answer is that it's part answer and you had part question in there. And I think if we are going to be successful in education, there has to be almost leading with curiosity that we're actually asking questions, trying to get better. And as soon as I have several friends that are teachers in classrooms and they posted within three minutes after January 1st, that chat GPT was already blocked. Like the second they could block it, it was blocked already. And it, that actually often happens because of a lack of information, not a curiosity for more that we're not actually trying to like, okay, how do we utilize this? How do we actually exactly. tap into this and tap into that? So I appreciate that you're saying like, Hey, here's some thoughts and ideas, but also I have some questions too, to figure this out. And I think if we always ask questions, that's when we start, we'll start seeing results. But e even the question, I, Hey, like, why do we have some of these structures? Why do we have some of these boxes in our schools? because we always had them. We need to always like replace this job title with the, with a person in that job title. Maybe we need to rethink some of this stuff, right? Like we, you hear, oh, we're going to have 50% or a hundred, 50% or whatever the stat is of jobs that exist now are going to exist in 10 years. But then we try to stay within a structure of schools where we just keep the same jobs and do the same thing. Yeah, that's exactly it. The interesting thing is that <clears throat> If you're looking to improve and change schools, you have to be willing to embrace some level of unpredictability. And now I'm not talking the industrial grade strength, unpredictability of the pandemic, certainly, but right. we have to inter accept some level of unpredictability to be able to add in the elements of wonder and curiosity back into the experience. It's easy to get an education. You have things that work. As a classroom teacher, you have things that work and you rely on those things. In the book, I make a mention of the fact that the book recognizes that teachers have those things. I'm not asking you to discard those things. I'm asking you to think of different ways in which you can add dimension and depth to your, to your practice. I don't know. It's, it's that whole, these things come around, around once in a while. Think about the pandemic, George. All of a sudden the schools are thrust into remote learning. And my question in a lot of ways is about the pandemic experience, how many schools stopped? took a deep breath and said, what did we learn about the pandemic and how can it influence where we can go? And I don't think a lot of schools did that. I think a lot of schools, understandably so, ran back to the known experience and the comfort of that. But there's a missed opportunity to say, hey, where's, we have all this community-based understanding of teaching and learning, and we have a new, same thing in schools. How do we make sense of that? And how can it influence our future? And rather than just going back to the known experience, the idea of curiosity is an interesting one. I don't know how curious schools are, but if you could probably ask schools to improve in one way, it'd be developing a greater ability and a desire to ask different questions. As you're talking, one of the things I've been sharing with groups that I'm working with is that are we so desperately trying to get back to 2019 or did we learn some things that we're saying, Hey, we can do something way better. Cause so let's get back to what we were doing before, even though for many kids and honestly, many teachers, what we were doing before wasn't working great. And so I think that's one of the things when your, your work in this area of design thinking is really beneficial because as you said, it's not like replacing getting rid, but it's really about focusing on depth. And I think 
it, it's so easy to fo- for schools to get focused on the new, the trendy and all these other things, as opposed to really, really rethinking and a lot of times just maybe tweaking some things, maybe replacing some things, but focusing on that depth of learning, which is so crucial. So I'm going to ask you this question and maybe this is going to be a TikTok video. So let's see how, if you can do this in 60 <laughs> seconds or less. What is design thinking? What is that? What does design thinking mean? You got, I'm putting you on the 60 second TikTok timer to see if you can do this. Oh, that's the, I can do that in, in, in less time than that. Design thinking is a human centered approach to solution finding. Simple as that. I mean, you can't give, give me more. Then now you got to dance or something because it's on TikTok. No, that's, th- 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 no you're not going to get, th- no one wants to see that, George. <laughs> Trust me. Okay. Hey, so give, give me like a, <clears throat> what, give me like a, an example of in a grade three classroom. Great question. So it's, so what it's about is po- posing kids questions that matter. A question that matters and then it's providing them with a process that that takes them through an investigative approach to developing a solution and not only developing a solution but one that's implementable so kids can make differences no matter what grade level they're at they can make differences in the world and what better time than helping them to learn how to shape their world than the school year so it's about a new role for a teacher and it's not about a teacher directed classroom and obviously it's a student-centered classroom but it's about engaging kids in questions that matter and having them understand the process and having abilities. I'm not that familiar with third grade, I'm in this, so hmm. let me give you a high school example. You know, when I taught, I did a problem, project, problem-based learning unit on Canada geese in Chicago and it fruit by my freshman. The, and most, I found out, the most dangerous in the world, by the way. So most Canada geese can't find Canada on their best day. They are uh, terrifying. They, I'm terrified. Just, I, like I know, I just, they're walking around, it's just crazy. <laughs> The chase and all that. But I found out a couple of things. One, that 14 year olds didn't really care about Canada geese. <laughs> <laughs> and two, they didn't have the skills and abilities to engage in that kind of process. They knew how to sit there and listen to me and take notes and do well on tests and so on. But when you place them in a different role where they were lead investigators, for example, lead designers, they struggled with that. So the design approach, for example, here's an easy, here's an easy example. When I taught a cellular division, and I mentioned this in the book, do you remember mitosis, George? I do. Give me the I phases. I got explain to you, but I remember taking it. Give me the phases. Come on. No, don't, don't put me on the side. I told you it was bad at science. Yeah. <laughs> Interphase, prophase, metaphase, antiphase, and telophase. Okay. Oh, that's so, what I was going to say. That's what I was No say. kids remember that. And you can t- teach them that. And I used to s- spend two days in the overhead projector. Yeah writing out the phases in the steps and the qualities or the characteristics of each phase. And they'd memorize and do good on a quiz and then take two days to do that. And they'd do one of the tasks because it's not that difficult. And then that two weeks later, they wouldn't know much about it. So what I'm asking to go to your question is, is that where are the authentic connections in what you teach in your curriculum and your content where you can reshape Instead of a standard unit-based step-by-step sequential lesson format, can you begin with a question that takes kids into an experience that's filled with wonder and curiosity that asks them to explore meaning and explore ideas, takes them into this mix where more questions emerge, they have to make sense of that, and it requires a whole different skill set. So in the come out with some kind of solution, some kind of thing that means something to people. For example, in the mitosis question, mitosis is cancer, for example, is runaway cell division. And normally cells divide and they stop. Sometimes they don't stop and they continue to divide and they form a mass called a tumor and that might impede a body process or an organ and you have cancer. So there's a way and say, give, let's give kids a reason to understand and why they want to understand cellular division. So we begin with a question, for example, how might we help childhood victims, is not the right word, but how might we create solutions that help kids that have young kids that have cancer, make their lives more manageable and understandable and happier. And that's not a very good, off the top of my head, that's not a very good provocation, but so we're linking content and ideas and what they should learn to a real question. And then that's explored through the human process centered process where you have kids talking with cancer oncologists and adult survivors of cancer and they're going on the internet and researching and they're doing all these different things that enlarge the boundaries of what learning can be and what school can be. And so that's the power of the design process if we start with this big front end discovery approach that's steeped in empathy and understanding who you're designing with and for and giving them a question that matters and allowing them to explore that. One of my colleagues, for example, took a local hospital and said, how can we make this 
is hospital more child friendly? It's a great question. And so what you're doing is you're understanding the issues that kids have at hospitals and you're asking kids, you're asking doctors, you're asking parents, you're doing all that research. And that's what separates this design thinking from project-based learning in a lot of ways. A lot of times in project-based learning, the outcome is a project. Okay, that's fine. The outcome of in design thinking is a solution for human beings that makes our lives more enriched and better. The front end of that is, is again, that discovery approach where you look at, you, you, you get kids in there and you dig deep into the problem. And you really understand it through the lens of human beings. That's where the power of the process comes into play. But instead of, and I'd love to see ultimately, George, a, a, a class, whether it's third grade or high school, be a series of provocations, a series of design challenges. Ultimately, that's what, what, what I think a classroom can be that leads kids through these questions where they develop these rich skills, they engage other people as human beings, and they develop real world solutions that actually get implemented, not go on a binder and a shelf. Right. And so uh, that, that's the power of design. Okay. So I got another two parter, but the first part is a really quick question. How long right. have you been doing design thinking? Like how long would you say given 10 years, 10 years? Okay. So. 10 years ago, you saw the relevance of this. Obviously, you still see the relevance of this now. So this is the longer question. And this is what I find really powerful about this. And I can give an answer to this, but I, you're the expert here. 20, 30 years from now, why is this still going to be relevant to a classroom? Because a lot of times it's like things get replaced. And I see there's a huge power in this. But how do you see that 20? Because we're already, you're already have 10 years experience it. You're seeing more relevant than ever. But why is this going to be relevant 20, 30 years from now? Human beings will always encounter situations that have to be addressed through understanding who people are and what the solutions are that can make their world a better place. That's actually not going to decline. <laughs> That's certainly going to right. increase. So we need to start developing kids that can address problems right now. And in, I don't, I don't over, over the years, like your things come and go and processes come and go, but design has been, think of this, name me something that you use on a daily basis that hasn't been designed. Right. And there's different degrees of the success of those designs, but everything that we use on a daily basis and anything that we encounter is gone through some kind of design process. So design is as old as human beings. It's taken on different shapes and different forms, and different complexities. But it's always going to be here because we have a need for developing solutions. And that's what design does. The difference here is, and this is one of the things that, that I'm a big believer in. I don't think design thinking so much as a problem solving approach, but more of a solution finding approach. I think there's, I think there's a little bit of a difference there. And you know, I always struggle to really identify that, but I think I'm more focused on not solving problems, but I'm thinking I'm more in solution fi finding. And I think they're related, of course, but I think the outcome is much more positive and enriched when we look at solutions rather than just simply trying to solve a problem. The, and this is one of the things I really appreciate about your work and what you do. A book that really influenced me and was, and I read, I think about five to 10 years ago, it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's Dale Carnegie. And that was the first time I read that book. And I, I just love the ideas. I thought it was really interesting. And I was like, I don't like, how come I've never read this book before? I know it's been around for a while. So then I actually looked it up when it was written. It was like 1930 something. I'm like, seriously, yeah. it's amazing. And so one of the things that we try to do is when we look at what we publish for books, we want them to be relevant 30 years from now. And I think that's your work. There, there's never going to not be a need for that. So I think that's what makes it so powerful. So this is the last question I got for you. All right. What do you hope the impact of your book is on classrooms? I hope the book presents a compelling case for a new experience. I hope the book provides a logical and approachable pathway for making those changes. I hope the book can provide teachers with new insights and new ways to think beyond their current experience. And ultimately, I think, I, I hope that the book provides at the end of the day and for making schools places of wonder and curiosity, places where kids want to come on a daily basis. I'll quote, I'll quote Chris Lehman here is in Diana Offenberg, and they always ask about what is the reason why we assemble on a daily basis? And I think that's related to the experience that you provide, the kind of the kind of culture that's created, the kind of 
belonging that's created that school can create. So, you know, all the schools are magical places that, again, they go back to launching the lives of kids. And I'm a big believer in that. And so kids don't, schools need to believe in places need, classrooms need to be places of opportunity where kids can explore the world. I think this book and the design process itself gives kids a way to connect to their future selves, their future lives, and create the skills and dispositions of, of educated people that allow them to be effective contributors to society. I love it. And like I said earlier, one of the things I really appreciate about the way you write, the way you communicate your messages, you take really complex things, except for mitosis. <laughs> There's nothing you could do with that. With no, that. it's hopeless. But you take complex ideas and you make them very simple and attainable. And I really appreciate that. And so I'm really excited for this book. I know it's going to make a huge impact on so many educators. So if you want, just make sure you take a check in the links down below. You'll see David's book. And connect with David on Twitter. He, if you have any questions or ideas you want to share with him, I know he'll respond to you. I know you're also on LinkedIn too, right? So we'll get yeah, that. Yeah, I'm everywhere, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so make sure you connect with David. David, thanks so much and congratulations on the release of your book. Thank you, George. And thanks for the opportunity to write it. I appreciate yeah. your support. All right. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening. Take care. Thank you.